Um, it, it, you know, it's funny. It's, it's almost become a cliche that succession is such an important thing for every business to think about and that you can't possibly start thinking about it too soon. And yet it's also a cliche that nobody does that. Nobody, <laughs> almost nobody, actually gets started really thinking seriously about succession. So I'm curious, you have been through it twice now. You guys, mm -hmm. to some extent, both have been through it twice. You've had a, a chance kind of <laughs> to do it again, mm -hmm. maybe fix some things you got wrong the first time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'd like to walk through a little bit. Yeah. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, when did you start thinking about succession at IMES? When did it occur to you that this was something that you were gonna have to deal with? I think, I think we thought about succession a lot, uh, in the, even in the 80s when the kids were in grade school and high school. We talked a lot about- Remind us, when did you sell IMES? 1999. But we, we talked about succession a lot. The kids were interested in, in what was going on in the business at that time. And the idea was that uh, my, my mentor, one of my mentors, Len Danko, said that you ought to put a sign on your wall that says, that says, um, I can't, let me see if I can phrase that right. This business will survive forever. And, and what he believed, and I believed, is that you build a business that will survive forever. And if you really mean that, then you have to have successors. You have to have people that are going to take over, you know, after after you. And so I would say we we started talking and thinking about succession, you know, in the in the 80s, and then we got real serious about it in '95 when uh, when my last kid graduated from college, and then I'll go on and tell that story a little bit later. But uh, uh, yeah, that's that's the answer. Well, well, well tell me this too then. Um, you know, we've gotten used to the idea of IMES as a huge corporation and then as part of another even bigger corporation. Uh, I think most people here know that you sold it for billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. At the time you started thinking about succession, did you think of IMES as a family business? We had hopes. Um, we, we talked, again, we talked a lot about it and uh, we had hoped that, uh, you know, at some point somebody would want to want to step in. But as we got together and we started thinking about and talking about the issue, it became more apparent to me that there was nobody in the company, in the, in the family, that was passionate about the business. They liked the business. They liked the people that worked in the business. They were proud of the business, but it wasn't their passion. And we always taught them that you need to follow your passion. You need to do the things you love to do. And there are so many families and so many businesses out there that are second generation where the second generation is very unhappy uh, because they're, they, they went into the business because their, their parents wanted them to be in the business or they thought their parents wanted them to be in the business and it didn't turn out very well. And I wanted my kids to have that freedom, the same freedom that I had when I was coming up. Did he succeed at that? Did you feel any pressure? No, I, I think I don't think we ever felt any pressure. I mean, I, I think uh, the opportunities were there. I think you, uh, you and mom were very clear about what the pathway was to do that. And so, um, you know, for my own circumstance, I mean, I, I, you know, just retired from baseball after an injury and I wasn't really thinking about dog food, for Christ, you know. Uh, and uh, I, I remember, um, you know, retiring, and then a little bit later, I had a conversation with my dad in his office, and he, I said, well, so what does it mean if I, like, come into the company? He said, well, number one, there's only one way to go. I mean, there's only one place that you'll end up. You'll either end up out or you'll end up at the top. It's okay, well, talk to me about that. And then it was this long list of things that I would have had to have done, move to Europe and run South America and maybe do something in Asia. And of course, once again, I, my wife and I were expecting our first child and, you know, I was still, you know, not happy that I had to retire from baseball. And so I was like, forget that, I'm not doing that. I mean, and, and I think that, uh, you know, I think that was kind of the, the free will that you gave us to be able to say, no, that's not for me. I mean, I think a lot of, 
of my peers that I meet and not necessarily have that choice. Um, and I think the thing that mom and, and dad had always done for us is given us a choice. And that, that's really, there's an empowering feature in choice. And, uh, and so I, I just said no and we kind of went off and did my own thing. So. For those of you who may not know, Mike isn't, you know, wasn't just a weekend baseball player. He was a professional who made it to AAA and had hopes of making mm -hmm. it beyond that yeah. and reasonable hopes. Talk about the process. When you decided that you wanted to think this through and figure out what the next step would be, how did you go about assessing whether there was passion uh, you know, in the well, family? Well, we, we, we started a family council in 1995. And the idea of the family council was to maybe help us sort out some of these some of these issues so, and one of the big issues in 1995 was well what happens to the business what happens to the family in the business and, and all of that and it took us until 1997 I think to so it took us two years of kind of intense meetings uh, some of them got a little hot you know but we we, we came whoa, down whoa, 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 whoa. tell us a little about that <laughs> What are the issues? My wife's in the audience. She should tell it. Yeah. Yeah. Mary, say hi. <laughs> Mary, I'm going to come out into uh, the crowd and take questions in a little while. So if you have any questions that you've been waiting to ask, <laughs> this could be your opportunity. Yeah, my wife's right next to her. So. Oh, excellent. We had, it seemed like every meeting, the early meetings, the family meetings, it seems like every time we had a blow up, we had some major confrontation or someone said something that bothered me or upset me and I said something that upset them. And uh, it was a, so for about two years, it was almost like a, uh, like, a refer like a wrestling match or boxing match or, or whatever. And until we finally started working together and we could civ be civil to each other and we could sit in the same room, not get angry. And we finally got to the point where we could we could say, here are the issues, now do we want to start to address them? And it took us about two years to work through that. And in 1997, we decided that none of the kids wanted to come into the business. They, they didn't care whether they owned it or not, so it was not a matter of them you know, getting money. It was just a matter that it was better for us to continue on and them not be involved. And so, and of course we did, but in 19... Clay, I gotta stop you, I'm sorry. Forgive me, I'm a, I'm a reporter. That's okay. You blame, blame Joni. She's you're you're gonna make to some this. sense out of this, I no. know. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna know what those issues were. I have a hard, a hard time imagining you getting upset, and I'm just curious. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you might know them you better than I You haven't been around me very often. <laughs> What were the issues? What, what bothered you? What wasn't going the way you wanted it to? Well, these stinking kids are setting on all this, now we're all, this, all, this, all this resource and all this money flowing in and everything. What have they got to complain about, you know? <laughs> Mike? <laughs> <laughs> I just stayed quiet during the meetings. I didn't say anything. Oh, I think, you know, um, it was all this, the soft issues. I mean, you know, when, you, when you're working in a business, when, uh, say, the family members would have come into the business, you know, a lot of those things would have came to light sooner, right? So we would have had to work on those things much sooner. Uh, that wasn't the case with us because we weren't working there. But we knew they were kind of dormant in a way. And at the end of the day, our, our family's vision is a family united forever. So the soft issues about conflict resolution, how to communicate, you know, doing the things that it makes us a family were the more important things. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure we kind of had a, a true intention around that, but we found it out really quickly that, boy, we need to learn how to be a family. We need to learn how to talk to each other and respect each other. We need to learn to, to be able to communicate. And if we have disagreements, how do we stay at the table instead of walk away? And so we're still working on that today, by the way, but we're 25 years into that. So uh, you can imagine that, you know, even though you got five kids in the, in the house, each one of them related to mom and dad differently. And so we all had our own triggers around 
you know, what, what dad was saying and what they weren't saying. So maybe I didn't react to something dad said, but maybe somebody else did. And so to bring those things to light and to talk about those things were, was probably the most powerful thing our family's ever done. Mm -hmm. Because today we're a family and we stay at the table and mm -hmm. not everybody has to agree that we, around the table, but we're all still sitting there. And I think it has to do a lot with, once again, mom and dad's foresight to be able to say, hey, look, we need to work on these <coughs> things and I'm gonna be vulnerable enough for my kids to get pissed at me, which is really, really hard. That was a really tough time. And so of course he's gonna to react to that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, well, why wouldn't you? I do it to my kids today. So, um, and so, you know, there's, there's just that, that piece of, of, of being in that environment. And whether that existed within the business or, or you know, just in these meetings, it, that stuff still has to come out. There's still one, has to come out. There's one important piece is when we put the family council together, we hired a consultant mm -hmm. and he brought along a psychologist. Now you laugh. But the psychologist was a lot busier than the family council. Mm -hmm. uh, but, <laughs> but, but I would say that that, that was an important part, For too, sure. is That's that they right. helped us understand. They, they've seen this kind of thing before. Uh, you know, they, they kept us at the table. Uh, they dealt with the, the conflicts before they started, the eruptions, if you will. We used to call, these, we used to call them referees instead of consultants. But, mm -hmm. Um, but they helped, they kept us at the table and they helped us, you know, with other families and seeing what other families had done and, and, but at the end of the day, it was, it was really worth it, but it did take a long time and it was, it was very, it was very difficult, very hard. Mike talked before about the conversation you had about what it would take for him to get involved in the business and you laid yeah. out some steps he would have to take, yeah. including moving around the world. Yeah. Was that kind of a test on your part? Were you looking to see if he had really had the passion? Yeah, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wanted to see if he'd be willing to, mm -hmm. you know, pack, pack up and, and go to Europe for a year or go to mm -hmm. South America and run our new plant down there or whatever. You remember what you said to me? You said, you have to wake up every day and want to kick Hills' ass. That's what you said. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I still remember. I still remember it today, and I was like, I don't really care about doing that. So. <laughs> you remember saying that to me? Well, I do now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it gets back to the passion thing. Yeah. And they, they were always very, uh, very good, mom and dad both, very good about chasing our own passions. And, um, and so I think all of us have done that, quite frankly. So. Did, did you waver at all? I mean, this is, you were being offered a pretty incredible opportunity. Yeah, there. but it was, it was daunting at that time. I mean, it was just daunting at that time. I mean, 10 years later, it might have been different, but it was daunting. Uh, I'd still not finished my degree, uh, so I left early to go play baseball, so uh, I still hadn't uh, had my degree. Um, we had a, our second one on the way. My wife is back there, too, Michelle. Hi. Um, and... Uh, there are fact checkers, by the way. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, you know, it, it was so daunting at the time. I mean, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do and, and I knew I needed to go back and finish my degree. And, and, and I needed a couple of years just to get my head around that, you know, I had to give up my dream, you know. So, uh, so it was not the right time and was, certainly was not the right environment for me to be in. But he, you know, he could have easily forced it. I mean, he really could have. I mean, it's an, attra it's an attractive offer, right? I mean, uh, but he could have easily forced it, and he didn't. He, he, he gave me a choice, which was great. But he was very clear about what the expectations were. He was very clear about that, so. So when you accepted that nobody in the family was gonna take over the business, mm -hmm. what happened next? Well, it, it changed a lot of things. And the first thing it changed was we had to find another way to fund the business or another way of, of monetizing the asset that we had because we had all of our money in the business. Plus, we were running about a two to $300 million debt on top. So if we we're gonna to continue to grow the business, we needed to raise capital. And one of the ways obviously was to go public, to be acquired, uh, you know, all the different, you know, all the different, uh, different options. And we decided that probably the best 
solution for the family was to sell the business. And so we hired a new Because? Investor. Hmm? Why, because. why did you decide that? Because it was a lot cleaner. It, it got us liquidity, which is what we needed to do some of the other things that we all wanted to do. Um, and um, it, would just, it was just a better solution all the way around. And uh, so we hired J.P. Morgan to you know, put together the books. And At that point, was it your intention to sell the company and remain involved? No, I, I knew that if I sold the business that we would not be involved. And I was willing to, and I had done, you know, I'd sort of given up the control, operating control of the business 10 years before. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't in act, that actively involved in the day to day. Uh, Tom, the guy that, that ran the company, he was in favor of whatever we wanted to do, but certainly supported you know, our decision to, uh, to sell the business. Well, about the time that we were getting the books prepared, uh, Procter & Gamble calls and says, uh, we heard you were gonna, you're looking to sell the company, the Iams Company. We've been looking at pet food for about five years and we've decided that we want to buy your company and make that a platform for our pet food business worldwide, which I, I thought, man, this is a perfect this is a perfect situation because P and G had no pet food business, so they had no internal experts. They needed all of our people. They needed all of our plants. Mm -hmm. You know, they needed the, the senior management, uh, and I thought this is a this is a marriage made in heaven. And for the first five years, it was phenomenal. They doubled in sales in in five years, but then P and G got greedy. And they started, you know, wanting to make more money, more money, more money. And they took quality out of the product and they changed their distribution system totally. And uh, anyway, that's another story maybe for another time. <laughs> I think ahead of myself. But, but an interesting story. Um, wh when you... But I would say this about the, 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 uh, the session, a very important part. P&G brought their CEO, CFO, and all their senior managers up to Dayton and met with Mary and I in our conference room and looked us in the eye and we felt good about them, they felt good about us. I think we had a good, a good rapport and when we came out of the meeting, Mary says, I think that's the, I think that's the best solution. And it, it was, it was absolutely the best solution. What were your primary concerns in talking to them, uh, other than price, obviously, um, but were there other stipulations you wanted to make things that you wanted to see happen? Well, we had certainly had a concern about the community. So we wanted to make sure that the community was, was being supported the way we had supported the community. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the, the, that the science was continued to promote high quality, high nutrition, and all of that. How could you make sure that would happen? Well, I think by having some of the Ions people in charge of their research. I think that's that's the way we, that and that would, was that the case happen. and that's at least initially way, that's what happened. Yeah. So and and certainly the employees, how the, how the employees were going to be treated, uh, if there was any severance packages, we wanted to understand them, uh, and we, they were very generous. And I would say 90 to 95 percent of the employees that we had when we sold the company stayed with the business for four or five years, and they they contractually agreed to all of these to all of these conditions. Uh, there was one more I forgot uh, that, that was important to us, uh, the criteria. Something involving um, employees maybe? Well, you know, they, they were taken care of. Um, community, certainly. Science. Certainly. Location, did they have to? Yeah, they had to remain, the headquarters had to remain in Dayton. Yeah, right. For? For a five year period, which they agreed to. Mm -hmm. And they fulfilled their obligation. Yeah, so. so I'd say overall, I think it was the right decision, and overall, I still am very happy and probably would do it again. Is there anything you'd do differently, knowing what you know now? Um, <laughs> well, knowing what I know now, he's on the ground, and he's, he's, he's capable. I'd probably keep the company, because <laughs> 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 he could run it. And, uh, that, was the, that was the whole issue. One of the things that I hear a lot from business owners is they're, you know, if they're thinking about selling the business, the question they ask themselves is, if I do succeed in selling the business, then what? What will I be? What yeah. will I do? 
Yeah, it was. Did you struggle with that? Well, I, we had set up the family office in 97 with the idea that, you know, at some point we're going to have a large amount of money and we want to have, the, you know, the capability of investing it, managing it, and managing some of the resources for the, for the family in addition to that. So I had a place to go. So, you know, we sold the business. The next day, I, Jane Trout and I, my assistant, show up at uh, the office down at Simi. And we had an office set up down there, so it was just business as usual, you know. It just had a different phone number. In fact, I think I may have had the same phone number. I'm not sure. <laughs> so personally, it was a smooth it worked, transition for uh, The transition for, for me was, was fine. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I had done it a little bit before with Tom. Mm -hmm. That in, I had had to turn over the operating control of business to Tom you know, 10 years before, eight years before. And uh, that, so I had done it before. I knew there was going to be a void, and I knew that I was going to have an opportunity to fill that void because we talked about, you know, this concept, the uh, entrepreneurial education concept. Um, Mary wanted to start a, a home for mothers and, and children, uh, so that was her passion. Which she did. Which she did and has done beautifully, very, very well. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 we, we really never, never really had concern about where we're going to spend our time because there were just so many other opportunities, mostly philanthropic. So fast forward, you took on the foundation, that became your focus, and then at a certain point, you kind of went through the same process, I assume. What eventually, Mike took over uh, the family foundation. How did that come family to be? Family office. The family office. How did that come foundation. to be? Well, um, I don't know, Mike, do you want to go first on that yeah, one? Yeah, it just became an interest, right, for me. Um, you know, I I'd, I'd, I'd since gone back, finished my degree, had a couple of other uh, stops along the way, and then um, went to, to business school at Notre Dame and got my MBA and then bought a business. And my dad said, okay, now your MBA really What was the get, business? Uh, it's called, it was, it was called AccuTemp, but now it's uh, C-Safe Global, so it's a um, uh, temperature management solutions for pharma companies. Um, and so I bought that in 2004 and, and uh, began to start kind of being my own entrepreneur. But then all along the way, I kind of wanted to peek my head underneath the tent at the family office and just kind of make sure I kind of knew what was going on. And I just became more and more intrigued at the diversity of things that we were doing. Um, and. Uh, I was lucky enough to once again be kind of invited in, allowed to be sit at the table to kind of learn and, and, and watch and, and see what's going on. And uh, you know. did you have to demonstrate your passion this time? No, I think it was more. Uh, yeah, I think it was. <laughs> no, he had to go to Timbuktu yeah, this time. Yeah, I think it was different. <laughs> yeah, I think it was different this time certainly because the passion was around um, what could the family do now with these resources, right? And that, that intrigues me a lot. What platform can we now build that allows the family to live out its value system? Um, and so uh, today we, we, uh, we kind of operate under Grow, Give, and Unite. You know, we want to grow our wealth through financial investments, grow the talents of our people. We want to give to those that have demonstrated the capacity to change. And we want to do this while uniting as a family, as a community, and as a country. And so we, w that's a platform, I think, that we can really do some special things with. And of course, philan philanthropy and some of the strategic philanthropic things like Aileron and the Glen are, uh, and the fa Family Foundation are, are two or three you know, major opportunities uh, for the family to be involved and for the family to do impact the world in a really specific way. So when you talk about passion, that, that was kind of there, but it was in its infancy, really. It, it didn't really understand what it could be. Um, but then I think as you get to know the diversity of what we could do, I think that that kind of spurred from there. And we said, hey, look what we can do with this. And, and that's when I think the transition kind of really began, because I, I started to get more passionate about what you were doing, of course. and and then what the family could do in, in, as a whole. So. Well, then one day he came in and, and uh, he sat down and, uh, um, at the table in my office and he said, I think I know what I want to do. 
And I said, oh, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to sit in your chair. <laughs> and that was mm -hmm. when? I don't know what year that was. Probably 07, 08. Yeah, something frame. like that. Yeah. And then we talked about, you know, the mm -hmm. kinds of things that... You didn't throw him out of the office? Didn't throw him <laughs> out. I did tell him he, he need, a couple of things he needed to do, and I, I felt it strongly that he got an MBA. I said, you're going to be... People are going to be working for you that have MBAs, and if you don't have one, you're, you're not going to... You're not going to be at the same level. It's just the way it is. And uh, so he jumped on that and went to, went to Notre Dame, got his MBA, and um, then bought the business. Or did you buy the, no, you bought the yeah. business right. after About you. About the same time. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So when you ultimately took over, mm -hmm. did you basically just continue to do things exactly the way they had always been done oh, by no. your father? No, not at all. No? no? But there was an eight year transition, right? So mm -hmm. from 2003 to 2011. So dad said, I think, I don't know, at some point you said on 111.11, I'm done. So that really gave us a mark where he was going to be 70 and he wanted to be done. And so that was probably four or five years out from the time. That we put a plan together. Yeah, put a plan together. And, and uh, so, but from 2003 to 2011, um, that was a transition period. I mean, that, it took eight years for kind of me to really kind of understand the aspects of the enterprise, understand the, the nature of you know, this platform that was kind of unfolding in front of us. And, um, and then since, on 1-11-11, you stepped out, I stepped in, as the first among equals, by the way. So our model is first among equals. So I'm, I'm not the boss, I'm just the first among equals of, our, of my generation. So, um, and, uh, and... You're talking about first among equals, meaning First among family members. members. Yeah, that's right. So all of our family members, there's 10 family members in the second generation. We count our spouses. And so I'm the first among equals of all of them, um, which was voted on by family council. And that's our governance structure. A lot of other families have different governance structures. Um, but that's the way I kind of view my role today. And so over the last six years, six, seven years, we've been kind of transforming this enterprise into this platform of Grow, Give, Unite, and really, you know, the broad stroke of stewardship. How do we steward our family's resources in a way that enable us to grow, give, and unite? Was that a smooth transition in terms of you gradually assuming power or I think you know, there, becoming there first among some, equals? Yeah, I think it, well, f so there's two tracks, right? So one was the relationship between the two of us, and then the other one was the relationship between myself and my siblings. And so uh, I'd set out very early to develop a relationship with each individual family member separately. And so, you know, lunches, you know, dinners, phone calls, whatever it was, I needed to understand and they needed to understand me, which I enjoyed doing, by the way. I mean, I get to sit around and have conversations with family members. I, I really enjoyed doing that. And so that was, um, you know, were that, those that easy conversations easy. or well, difficult I think conversations? They were, I think they were easier. And then I also was, you know, I was blessed to have some success in my own kind of career as, a, as an entrepreneur. So I had some credibility on it as well. And I think I was really the only one that was interested. So that even made it easier where they were all like, well, yeah, you do, you do that, you know. And, <laughs> and I, you know, and that was okay. I mean, it was fine. Um, but I think the, the more the bumps were between, you know, dad and I just really understanding who, you know, whose sandbox is who and, and who, who can play in whose sandbox and who can't and what, what decisions he can make and I can't make and decisions I can make and I don't want him to make. Um, and so it's all the, I think, a lot of those things. And they came up, you know, they might have came in waves, but then they also came you know, farther apart. Until, well, just recently. Yeah, until, yeah, just recently. Just recently. Yeah. I think I was getting in his sandbox or something. I don't remember the specifics, but. Well, I, I think it's a story maybe, that. Maybe you uh, do, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, just, it's the stories we tell, our, or it's the stories we tell ourselves. And so um, it was really just a miscommunication. It was miscommunication. There was uh, not a lot of transparency. And at the end of the day, um, you know, one of us had to step back and say, look, it's, uh, th this is you, you do this, and, uh, and it ended up, ended up working itself out. But it really comes from a lack of communication and clarity around what your role is and 
what you want to do. Yeah, and I never even, I didn't even realize that I had kind of overstepped. You know, I'd gotten into his sandbox mm -hmm. and almost, that's the nature, I guess, of how, what I used to do and how I've done things in the past. But, mm -hmm. but uh, he was able to tap me on the shoulder and we got some, mm -hmm. got a, a third party to help us uh, think through mm -hmm. and talk through some of these some of these mm -hmm. sandbox issues and we got them resolved and it's working better than it ever did. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, to his point, it's communication all the way. I mean. All right, so I think this is a great time to start taking questions from the audience. I'm gonna come down here and I got somebody who's already volunteering to start, please. This is probably an easy question, but uh, earlier in the discussion, the, the, the concept of what's your new role in the transition, and you had indicated, uh, Mr. Mattil, that you had a place to land. So now that Mike is responsible for um, the, the family business, where was your landing place? What's your new role? Do you have one? Well, um, I, w I advise and still do it on, to a certain extent with some of the directly uh, own businesses, although I don't interface with them. He, he interfaces, but we talk about... You still have a sandbox. Talk about strategy. Mm -hmm. And of course, I spend time here at Aileron and, and love it. I uh, love coming out here and I love being involved and, you know, have meetings with, with folks on a fairly regular basis. Um, and I have enough, you know, to... Uh, I just got a new uh, stock car, just bought a new... Uh, modified 1941 Ford convertible, so I got a toy. You're, you you're, sounds like you're having a midlife crisis. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, Mary said it was okay for me to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, right here. I really don't have a question. I just want to take the opportunity, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room feel the same way, but thank you for what you've done here. Well, thanks. Thanks for saying that. Appreciate it. Um, my question is, I'm second generation. I have the possibility of seven um, third generations, but we haven't really started anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just curious. I don't know which one of you guys, maybe both, would like to throw out your opinion on what I should do next mm -hmm. to kind of bring up the conversation. You have any thoughts about third generation? Yeah, well, we, yeah lots of thoughts about third generation. And, and I'll be very <laughs> candid to say that we are, uh, we're behind the curve. I mean, we, we have not spent a lot of time uh, on, on the third generation. Cause I think mostly because our philosophy has been let them have their freedom. Um, but I, I go back and, and ask you a question, what do you want your business to do? What, what, what's the purpose of your business? Um, and I, I think that'll drive how open you make that for that next generation to find a place in it. If, uh, and, and so I, I go back and say, what do you want this to do? I, I look and say, okay, well, the Matil Family Enterprise and, and, and Simi Holdings is a platform what is it that I want that to do? What, what is it that that can provide for the next generation? Well, it can provide internships, opportunities to be involved in different industries. It can be involved in philanthropic activities. It can be involved in family governance. I mean, th there's, a, there's a plethora of things now that we now have, have, are able to offer this next generation to be engaged and to feel a part of this Grow, Give, Unite structure that we've kind of put together. Um, and, and so I believe businesses are platforms for really living out your true value system. And so if you could define that, you know, we've heard a lot about that through the last couple of days about the real purpose of your business. And it, sometimes it has nothing to do with what the actual business does. But I think, you know, once you define that, I think you'll find a very a, a clear picture as to how these seven next generation kids can be involved. Um, and of course, there's all the other stuff like governance and things that, that will eventually be, in, be involved in that, but it's really about engagement. You know, how do they get engaged in your business, if you even want them to be? Yeah, and I think, I think the, the point about clarity, too, just making sure that you're, you're very clear about what you want 
and they're very clear about with you about what they want. And uh, th there's another piece too. The, the, yeah, I say the kids didn't work in the business, but every one of our kids worked mm -hmm. on on weekends, uh, in, Summer in the summers, mm -hmm. and they ended up with real, real crappy jobs. Uh, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the the worst jobs in the plant, the, the jobs oh, yeah. that they that they did, and. The, the, there was a certain amount of uh, the employees had a, a tremendous amount of respect for my family because of the way the kids worked. They just weren't prima donna. They weren't prima donnas, and uh, uh, I think that's important too. They, they need to see the kids, but don't put them in charge of you know sales if they're 15 years old or something like that. You know? I think we have another question here. Yeah, so, uh, Mike, this is actually aimed at you. Uh, mm -hmm. If uh, if you'd made a different choice and actually took over I'm say the timing was right, where do you think the company would be today, and do you <laughs> think the industry would be different? Yeah, I mean, I, I first of all, I think the business is completely different, right? I mean, than, than it has. And uh, as you can imagine, we <laughs> see a lot of business plans, we see a lot of things, and uh, some of them are food related, if you will, and the, the industry's changed so dramatically. And so we, we have had some fun conversations about what that might look like and what would you do today versus before. Um, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know if that if it would have been any better. It would have been different for sure. Um, but I, I think, you know, you can't underestimate the power of, you know, his charisma and leadership and as Bo would say, mojo. I mean, the guy just had it in spades and people love him. I still have people coming up to me today going, oh man, I'd love to work for your dad again, you know? And it's true and I take a lot of pride in that because uh, he built a, an incredible, incredible business. Him and mom built an incredible business. And I, I don't think that would have been, trying to duplicate that would have been in, in our best interest. But making it something different, looking at it differently, you know, I certainly think it would be open to, you know, more people, more family members working in the business because the timing would have been right and things like that. That's a tough question, but I, you know, I don't think it would be better. I think it would be different. And there, there was no replacing the lion, if you will, you know, so. My colleague, Bo Burlingham, wrote another book besides Small Giants called Finish Big. Mm -hmm. Uh, on this very topic of succession. Bo, I'm curious if you have uh, a, a question for these guys or any observations, but I'm not going to give you the mic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'll repeat your question for you. <laughs> well, I'm not talking without the mic. Well, I think I think the fact it's 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 a good question, Bo. And I, I think again, I was fortunate that I had that experience with Tom. Uh, I had the, I was fortunate that we had set up a family office where I had some place to go, um, at least go and have lunch with somebody, you know. And because uh, Mary said she married for better for worse, but not for lunch. <laughs> so, so uh, um, you know. Uh, and I, and I and I had a, a per, I had a passion for education of entrepreneurs and wanted to do this. I didn't know exactly then what I know now, but wanted to do this. And and, and Mary wanted to become more involved with the foundation. She's taken over and, and run the foundation, done a great job, and I think that's been very fulfilling to her for her. So the combination of what we're doing and what she's doing, what we're doing together, and what we're doing individually, I think we have a really good balance. And uh, 
and I don't have to, you know, show up for lunch. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think it's a proper. I mean, I, you know, it, it took it took me a while to kind of understand this, but it's also how do you get the best out of him going forward, right? So at first I went, oh well, tell tell me, you know, tell me, and and whatever you tell me, I'll go do, right? And then it became, don't tell me anything. I'm going to go do it, and then I'll let you know if you need to know, kind of thing. And then it became more of a, you know, more of a partnership. I mean, it really became more of a thought partner. Yeah. And you that you of you that had the chance to speak one on one with Clay or have have time with him, a thought partner, having, having Clay Matilla as your thought partner, I mean, oh my goodness, right? So I think it's part of how, how, you, how you get the best out of people, how you utilize those, those resources you have, and how to, how to utilize this incredible knowledge, but not put the responsibility back on him, because he doesn't want it anymore. That's, that's part of the reason why he transitioned in the first place. And so I think part of it's knowing how to work together so that we you can be a thought partner now but mm -hmm. you don't have to own the decision and I think that took me a while to really figure that out and we had a lot of a lot of bouncy times around that especially when I was not as transparent because I wanted to do it on my own and I wanted I wanted you out or I I wanted to you know you had your people and I was trying to develop you know our new our new people going forward and so there was a lot of that kind of back and forth, but until we got that figured out, I think it was still rocky, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. yeah. And and some of the you tran transition has been, the last couple of years at least, has been really great. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I got to that point with Tom, where I became more his th thought partner than, than his boss, you know? Mm -hmm. So I went in with the idea that, look, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you what to do, I'm here to ask you a question, or here's a thought, or have you considered this, this idea, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, I, I, I wonder, Mike, when you went through the period of having to sort of give up your dream of becoming a professional baseball player, did you said that that took a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, it sure did. And uh, I'm, I'm curious as to how you actually made that transition. Well, I mean, I call it my dark years, um, and my wife can attest to that because she lived through a lot of that, and God bless her for it. Um, you know, I, I had plan A. I didn't think I had a plan B. Otherwise, I wasn't too sure of plan A. And, and so, um, and a lot of people in that industry don't. I mean, I just think they, they think they're going to make it, make it big, and the rest, is, the rest of your life is going to be on easy street. And I guess I was naive enough to think that was the same. And so when it's taken away from you, because I, I had an injury, and I, I think there is a difference, and I'm just saying this out of humility, but I think there's a difference between knowing that you could be there and it being taken away. So some people just don't make it because from a talent perspective, I truly believe that I was on track to make it, but I, I, but I had an injury and sustained an injury and that didn't allow me to further go forward. And so I think it was harder because it was like I knew I could do it if it wasn't for the injury. So it took me, I think, a lot longer to get over it. But, you know, at the, at, at the end of the day, you know, I'm about lifelong learning. I'm about growth. I've been taught that since I was a kid. And, and I think it just took me a while to get out of the funk. And quite frankly, I landed a job at the high school that I graduated from and became a coach and an athletic administrator. And it gave me something to do. I mean, it just kind of get, gave me something to do and get moving again. And, uh, and that was, in a sense, a lifesaver. And then I was able to, to work underneath a, a real charismatic man, Jim Place, who, you know, continued to kind of push me forward in looking at new things. So I think being around really good people just continued to help, you know, push me forward. And, of course, my family and my wife were instrumental in that as well. But it, it, took a, it certainly took a while, right? Because I didn't have anything to go to. You know, and and you're you're right. So that that was my uh, that was hard for me. That was hard. I think Lee Skolnick has a question. Uh, he got to know Clay in a way few people do while designing this amazing building, uh, and he also comes from a family business. I do. My my father was an entrepreneur who started as an immigrant and and started a 
you know, a grocery store with his family and built it into a business and actually he sold his to uh, Nestle um, when he realized that I wasn't going into the business. Um, but I, I have actually a very specific question about uh, transition and succession because the way I have viewed it and tried to get on that path is by offloading everything that I don't think I need to do that someone else can do as well or better. And frankly, I don't want to do I, you know, I did it. I was a one-man band. You know, now we're 35 people. Um, but there is something that I think I have to offer which I can't let go of. And that stands in the way, I think, of, of letting the succession be smooth. And that is the kind of mission or vision. You know, I, I started the the company and have um, over the years refined a real approach and a, a vision of, of how we do our work. And I don't know how to get to that next step where obviously for succession you need to let other people not just feel like they're going to continue to pursue your vision, but that you have to let them in. And I would just wonder if you have thoughts about how you make that, that transition. Yeah, you know, there is one thing. I'm, you know, I'm basically lazy. Um, I mean, I don't. I if somebody will do something for me, I let them do it, and that frees me up to do something, something else that I feel is more productive or is more fun. Now I get myself in trouble a lot when I do that because, you know, I don't check the people out as well, and maybe they aren't as qualified to do it as they should be. Uh, but on the other hand, I've had some success in that uh, people have ro risen well above where they thought they could be or where, where others thought they could be. So, uh, but, you know, and in your case, I know, uh, Lee, you're, you've got this creative business. And now how do you package that up you know, in a way? And I think the point that you made about, you know, giving up a lot of these things that, aren't meaningful to you is probably the first, really first good step. I remember Paul Imes gave me some advice one time when the business was starting to grow. He said, you gotta keep working yourself out of a job. He said, you just, you know, you, you get to a certain point where you can't do all of these functions anymore. Well, you gotta carve it up into, into an organization of some kind and you gotta hire people uh, to, and bring them in and, and hand, them, hand them the baton and, and, and move on. And uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to have done that. And I wanted to do it because I knew that I was probably, uh, I was probably the biggest inhibitor to the growth of the business. That's uh, after I got to a, a point in the 80s and early 90s. I knew that, and of course bringing Tom in was evidence of the fact that I had, I had maxed out in terms of my ability to, uh, to, to run a business. So. Other questions? But the vision, the vision thing is interesting, though, because, um, you know, would your 35 people have the same vision as yours, you know? And do you feel confident enough in those 35 people to continue to inch towards that vision, All right? So it's, it's probably a trust and confidence issue as well. If you're going to still own the vision, it's a little hard for you to transition if you're going to still own it. But if you're willing to give it up and let it evolve and let it become what it needs to become, not saying right or wrong, just something that might be different, uh, and empower and trust your people, they'll they'll live up to that they'll live up to that vision. I mean, I, I always I always think what was amazing about what Dad did was he had a vision of Imes being recognized as a world leader in cat and dog nutrition around the world, and you knew that you weren't going to be able to make that a reality without a significant investment from the family. And so you wanted to partner with somebody, you wanted somebody to acquire to make that vision a reality. And within five years, P&G made that vision a reality. He gave up his vision to somebody else to make, it, to make it possible. And I think as long as you're still tied to your own vision, you're gonna own it. So it's either got to change or you got to have trust that the people underneath you or the people that are working for you are, gonna, are going to uh, be able to achieve that vision. Yeah, that's my own personal thought. So. Good observation. 
Another question? First off, thank you both for being so transparent and really capping off a wonderful couple of days here. Really appreciate that. Um, I sometimes wonder as I move on in years whether if I don't have the business anymore, whether I will miss running the business. Not really owning the business, but running the business. So Clay, it's, it's been 18 years for you, and I, can you speak to times that you missed running the business afterwards? There were a few times, um, mostly around things like sales meetings and and, and that kind of thing, in places where opportunities I had to, to get face to face uh, with our employees. I spent a lot of time, you know, with the employees. And uh, so that was, I miss that. But the, the day to day, you know, grind it out, part of the business, no way. I mean, I. <laughs> But I love I love the uh, the customers, the people, the science. I love I love the science, and uh, and I loved uh, being able to do things in the community. Uh, we did a lot a lot of things uh, uh, through you know in, in the small towns that we that we operated in. Uh, we were a pretty big players, so we had to be involved in the community in, in quite a, a number of ways. And that, that, was, that was fun too, fun to get to know those people and, and, uh, and, and help them. Uh, we had one case where we actually helped them form a chamber. The little town didn't even have a chamber of commerce. So we helped them form the chamber and got involved in that way and sponsored some you know, hometown events in the summertime and things like that. But, um, so we're, the, we're, we're involved with customers, we're involved with people, and involved with the science, and involved in the community. You know, those are the things I, I guess I'd say I miss the most. 